I am Andy Rich. I'm the Dean of the Colin Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership here at City College of New York. It's our School of Social Sciences as well as the home for our public service and our leadership development programs. And I wanna welcome you to Leading for Democracy and Social Justice in a Time of Backlash. This is an event organized by Leadership for Democracy and Social Justice, a brand new CUNY Institute focused on training and supporting for uh, early and mid-career social justice leaders. For the past two years, the Colin Powell School has partnered with the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies to identify the potential for a new initiative to support social justice organizers and social justice leaders. The planning for the initiative has been led by Gara LaMarche, a senior fellow and an instructor here at the Colin Powell School, and by Deepak Bargava, distinguished lecturer at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Jessica Barbara Brown has worked with us to stand up the new institute. And the idea for it here at CUNY is born of conversations, frankly, among Deepak, Yara, and me that started well more than two years ago. It comes from discussions that each of us had separately over a number of years with many more people, including many other people joining us today, including those who are our speakers, that pointed to the need for a greater investment in the professional development of social justice leaders, folks who are organizers, advocates, policy people, people working on particular issues, and people working to build power and bring change. The effort is premised on the concern that there are too few on-ramps to social justice careers, particularly for people of color, for women, and for those from lower income and working class backgrounds. There are too few systems of support for those who are in the early and the middle career uh, stages. And so a consequence of all of this is that for too many people, um, you have early burnout, you have career shifts, and our movements become weaker as a result. This initiative aspires to address these challenges and to create space for healing, for community building, for mentorship, and for deep thinking about how our strategies and our tactics um, can align around big ideas, large ambitions, and the efforts to shift power. Many of us at CUNY are excited about it, and I am pleased to share that it was just in March that it was made an official CUNY Institute. So we are off and running and none too soon. The focus of today's discussion sadly could not be more timely. Leading for democracy and social justice in a time of backlash. We ended the day yesterday with an almost unprecedented leak from the Supreme Court, Roe versus Wade will be overturned. Of course, we've all seen this coming. Transforming the federal courts has been a 50 year project for the right in this country, but it doesn't make the news any easier. And it posits, I think, an immediate challenge to organizers and to movement builders. We're living in a time of backlash with respect to the rights of women, for sure, with respect to LGBTQ Americans, with respect to black Americans, with respect to poor people in this country, with respect to immigrants. And it goes for, further than that. We've seen a backlash against public health officials and public health systems, against experts and expertise of all kinds. And we have seen a backlash against democracy itself. So to say this is a difficult moment, I think is an understatement. How do we understand this moment? And how do we engage? How do we build power and create change? We have an extraordinary panel to explore these questions with us today. And we're honored to be joined by Representative Pramila Jayapal, Chair of the Congressional Black uh, Progressive Caucus to offer opening remarks. I'm gonna turn it over to Deepak to introduce our speakers. Just to note, the first portion of today's program will be a conversation among the panelists. Uh, then we will have a Q&A um, and the questions portion uh, can be, you can use the chat for your questions. And I, and I also wanna just highlight for everybody that we are recording today's event. So thank you for being with us. Let me turn it over to Deepak. Thanks so much, Andy. Welcome everybody. Um, to kick off our conversation, I'm really thrilled to introduce Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. She's been a longtime leader in grassroots social movements, and she's now chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. She's been, for many of us, a bright light in very dark and hard times. She and the CPC rallied progressive forces to win historic victories in the first year of the Biden administration. And it's just so appropriate to have her with us today because she's also been a leader in the fight to protect a woman's right to choose, which I, I know she'll speak to a little bit. Welcome, Congresswoman. We're so excited to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Deepak, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. But most of all, thank you for your vision um, to you and to Andy for creating this institute. I think there couldn't be a better time, a more necessary time for creating these pathways to leadership and social change. So deeply grateful to you for that. 
Um, let me just first begin by acknowledging the horrific leak draft uh, Supreme Court opinion overturning Roe v. Wade. If this is indeed coming to pass, um, and we should be clear at this moment that abortion is still legal in this country, it will be the most horrific rollback of women's rights in our history. And let me be very clear, I am one of one in four women across this country who have had an abortion. I have spoken about it publicly. I have testified about it in the house because I believe that unfortunately we need to tell our varied stories in order to bring light um, to the complexity of these decisions, how this is a fundamental human right and a freedom for us to make our own choices about our bodies and our futures. It is deeply tied to women's economic freedom and it is hanging by a thread because of the politicization of the Supreme Court and the court's apparent stunning refusal to honor precedent, to honor women, to honor freedom. And um, you know, I'm gonna be talking a lot about this over the next several days, but let me just say this decision puts an exclamation point on how absolutely essential you and your work are right now, how essential the movement for social justice is. Because just remember, and I spent 20 years as an activist, as Deepak knows, before coming to Congress, and I feel like I'm still an activist inside Congress now, overreaching attacks like these come when the other side sees how our power is growing. We really haven't lived through a political climate quite like this one before. And we can either see the situation as um, you know, a, a Supreme Court um, about to take action, uh, a, a senator, perhaps one senator torpeing an agenda and the will of millions of people, whatever the situation is, we can see it as the negative or we can recognize that we are so close so close to achieving the kind of transformational social justice that we have sought on so many issues from abortion rights, voting rights, LGBTQ equality, universal childcare, pre-K housing, tax reform, and so much more. So just reflect on this. We have on many of these issues that I have mentioned, I think every single one that I just mentioned, we have 99% of the Democratic Party, if not 100% of the Democratic Party and the President of the United States and independents and Republicans across the country with us on transformational policies, including the transformational policies that we passed in the House of Representatives in the Build Back Better bill, 99%. And reflect on this too. We have changed the narrative, social justice movements, around the country have changed the narrative around mythical concepts like trickle-down economics or even the need to provide forms of universal income like the child tax credit to alleviate poverty and hunger. That is now accepted as a truly effective policy to, uh, to eradicate hunger and poverty. And in just one year with the thinnest of margins in the House and the Senate, we did cut child poverty by 40%. We cut hunger by 32%. We brought unemployment down to the lowest levels in over half a century. We raised wages and gave workers choices in their jobs and supported the movement of workers to organize in huge companies like Amazon and Starbucks, where I was just yesterday talking to the workers at the Starbucks roastery that just voted uh, to uh, have a union in their workplace. And we've made the argument for things like student debt cancellation that would, if we canceled even $50,000 of debt for every person in this country, it would raise black wealth by 40%. So in one year with the thinnest of majorities building on decades of social justice organizing is how we got here. And by the way, in this last year, we got 70% of the people in this country vaccinated across America, despite lies about the danger of the virus that we faced. And honestly, we did much of this without a single vote from across the aisle. That is a sad fact in my view, because I believe that both parties in this country, in the course of this history, we might have disagreed on policy, but I have never seen the kind of uh, partisanship and more importantly, the kind of lies around our constitution that we are seeing today. 
Now, I also want to say we passed a historic infrastructure plan that hasn't delivered all of the funding out yet, but will create unprecedented funding for our roads and bridges, create a network of electric vehicle charging stations, get out of water, and create millions of good paying jobs. And just in March, we passed a huge omnibus package that increased funding to historic levels for high poverty K-12 schools, as well as so many other factors. And we renewed the Violence Against Women Act, which included my bill, Survivors Access to Supportive Care Act, to provide care that will assault survivors need. And we passed another piece of legislation that I did with my colleague, Sherry Bustos, to stop the use of forced arbitration agreements in cases of sexual assault, protecting 60 million people across the country from being forced into silence. Now, I tell you all of this not to tell you that everything is fine and dandy, not to paint a pretty picture that we're all good. That's not what I'm saying. That is not the case. It is tough. It is frustrating. It is scary. And we are a country that is enormously fraught with danger to our people, our country, and our democratic institutions. But what I also know from being an organizer in the social justice movement and learning from undocumented women who refused to give up, from immigrants who walked miles across deserts and bare feet to seek freedom, from workers who risked everything to take on their big and powerful bosses because they wanted something better, from the civil rights giants on whose shoulders we stand who refused to give up what barrier was put in their way, this is what I learned, that we organizers know how to get strength from crisis, how to channel our anger into something that is far more important and productive, and that is in leadership for this movement for change. We are facing a party across the aisle that attempted and condoned a coup. I don't mean to make this partisan, but I don't know any other way to say it. We are dealing with people who are trying to tell you that the insurrectionists that threatened my life and the lives of my colleagues on January 6th as we were trapped in the Capitol were tourists, that your eyes somehow deceived you when you saw on television or in person as I did these violent insurrectionists who launched the worst attack on the United States Capitol since the War of 1812. Yes, we are fighting for the soul of our democracy, for our constitution and for our democratic institutions from the Supreme Court to our elections boards. And there is much that we haven't done that is the backlash that hurts all of us personally. But I'm asking you to think about all that we have achieved because of decades and generations of people who refuse to give up. Our movement is growing. And those who oppose justice across the board and all of the issues that we fight for are afraid that we have the country with us on so many issues, not a party, but the country. There is a lot we have not done and we cannot stop fighting back, not only against Republicans, but frankly, even against Democrats in my own party who might give in to racist and xenophobic and fear-based arguments that so many of us have fought for decades now. But what I don't want you to do is let anyone tell you that you don't matter, that leadership doesn't matter, that the organizations that are in this movement for justice don't matter, that your voice doesn't matter. There is truly a lot at stake here, abortion rights, voting rights, affordable childcare and healthcare, immigration reform, a fair and living wage, police accountability, bold climate action. And if we could just get ourselves a few more seats in the House and the Senate, we can get things done because we are operating within a system that is broken, but we also have some tools still available to us to get to a place where we can really make change happen. We are so close and our country and our people are depending on us. And we need you also to help us push for more legislatively and through executive action over the next months. The Congressional Progressive Caucus, 98 members, which I chair in Congress, 
put out a slate of recommended executive actions that President Biden can take to lower costs and increase wages. And we've already seen movement from the president on several of these priorities. We got executive actions fixing the ACA family glitch and delivering health care to more than a million families. We saw an end of title or commitment to end Title 42, a racist and xenophobic policy that pre prevented mostly black and brown folks from seeking asylum in our country. We've begun to stop the efforts to privatize Medicare and we are fighting for student debt cancellation as we speak and we're very close. I always like to say that being a progressive means being first to the best and most just idea and then bringing everyone else along. Our collective social justice work together inside and outside of Congress means that our movement is bigger and stronger than ever. The people are with us across states, across party lines, across ideology. And the pressure is working. More and more lawmakers than ever before support the things that I have mentioned. And so our work is to lead movements for justice, whether we sit on the outside or the inside. We need to find that well of strength that is within all of us and has been there and present and clear to see in every activist throughout the generations of our history as they fight for their future and for our future. And if we do that, and if we use that anger, that frustration, that despair even, to highlight that what we're fighting for is justice, I believe our movement gets bigger. We can meet people where they are if we organize and inspire. And I really believe that we can and will win again. Thank you all so much for what you do. And this Leadership Institute is gonna be so important to our future. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for modeling what progressive leadership in a time of backlash looks like and for inspiring us to see what we have accomplished and what's possible if we keep the faith. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's my, uh, so a little bit of, of context for the panel. Um, you know, we are living in this time of backlash and really when we say that we're talking about a long arc of backlash to the gains of people of color over the last 50 plus years, a backlash specifically to the demands and progress brought about by the movement for black lives, by the immigrant rights movement. Uh, we're seeing an author authoritarian, what openly white supremacist movement gain traction in America. And as evidenced today by this um, potential Supreme Court decision, we're seeing a backlash to the gains of women and LGBT communities uh, in the attacks on abortion rights and on trans youth. So if you add to that COVID, two years of COVID, uh, ongoing climate uh, catastrophes that we're all experiencing, it's been perhaps the most challenging time to be a progressive leader, a leader in movements for social justice in many, many decades. So the question that we're gonna to engage today is how do you lead in a time of backlash? Because ultimately, as Congresswoman Jai Paul demonstrated, um, getting out of the place we're in will require people to rouse themselves and rouse others in what is gonna be a long struggle ahead of us. So we have three extraordinary leaders to help us make sense of this moment. Jen Disla is co-executive director of Detroit Action, a grassroots organization that builds power in black and brown communities in Detroit. Chris Torres is political director at moveon.org, a national online powerhouse organization with millions of members that fights for progressive change. Lorella Praeli is co-president of Community Change, a national organization that builds power for low-income people, especially low-income people of color across the country. So um, I wanna invite folks in the audience to put your questions in the Q&A function, and I'll be checking those out as we go. Um, and also you can connect to the Leadership Institute at socialjusticeleadership.org, that's socialjusticeleadership.org. So I wanna start with a question for you, Jen. Um, 
How have you experienced these last two tumultuous years as a leader, as a major leader in our movement? What's been challenging for you? How have you found resilience? First, thank you and the Leadership Institute for bringing an important conversation to the forefront at this time. You know, leadership during unprecedented and historic moments are challenging and they also offer opportunities for change. I actually started working at Trade Action in March of 2020, in the beginning of the pandemic. I had to learn how to develop deep relationships with members and staff, utilizing only the phone and this thing that they call Zoom. <laughs> and I could no longer get the complete picture on a person's emotion or reactions, and most importantly, connection and building power together. Additionally, I was personally was concerned about my family, the ability to see them again for I'm several hundred miles away from them. To reconnect to Detroit, coming from St. Louis, Missouri, the physical move was the easiest part, though the spiritual and emotional move the hardest. Then there was the murder of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And I was reminded as a black woman, how the criminal justice system disregards my life in this country. I found my resilience in protesting with my comrades around Black Lives Matter. Even then, the, cha the challenge of not only the traditional protest safety measures, now there was a virus that no one at the time could manage. And Black and Brown people were and continue to be impacted the most, impacted by loss of jobs, housing, and most importantly, their lives. I continue my resilience with the community by holding those in power accountable to placing their values into actions. Corporations have committed to racial justice, though they have continued to bankroll the politicians attacking the freedom of Blacks and working class people to vote. In Michigan, we continue to defend Black voters and will hold six of the, six of the Michigan's largest corporations accountable for funding voter suppression. We must continue to create pathways to uphold democracy, especially while our rights are under attack, like today's remarks on, on Roy versus Wade decision. Reproductive rights are economic justice rights. It will impact black and brown women the most. Ultimately, continuing to build power, community power to fight for our rights gives me the resilience to fight for a better future for my community. Thank you so much, Jen. That was a very powerful illustration of the principle that individual leadership needs to be situated in a collective, um, that we don't make it through these difficult times on our own. I want to invite Lorella or Chris, if you have any reflections from your own experience of leading in these couple of tumultuous years to, to weigh in. I can jump in. Um... So I, I think it's been really hard to catch our breath. Um, I, I think I want us to remember that the pandemic really came after three extraordinarily difficult years under Trump and that it is okay to acknowledge that it has been exhausting. To understand that the last two years, um, to, to understand what the last, have, the last two years have been like is really to zoom in on both the bad and the good, uh, Deepak the harms of the Trump era, the 1 million pandemic deaths in the US, January 6th, the rise of authoritarianism and emboldened white nationalism, the structural limits and the fragility of our democracy. And it is also to understand that we defeated Trump in 2020, the victories in Georgia and Arizona, the democratic establishment's embrace of a progressive social and economic agenda, really following decades of multiracial and Black-led organizing, though I recognize that this also means Dems' deference to institutionalism, the racial uprisings of 2020, the recent victories for local worker organizing, there's a lot to be hopeful about, but there's no way to really separate your personal experience from the external. Uh, we are in the battlefield every day, so for me, personally and professionally, it has been hard. The pandemic coincided with my first years at Community Change. We went into lockdown just six months after I started at the organization. 
And though remote capabilities have been amazing and so helpful, the pandemic still really impacted my ability to build and deepen relationships with staff, partners, funders, and to learn firsthand about our work on the ground. I think for the work, organizing requires building relationships and it's just harder to build those relationships without being face-to-face. -face. So I think that our entire field as they've innovated um, has also faced uh, tremendous challenges given sort of the state. And then I'm gonna toss to you, Chris. Um, and then I think that there are also lessons on resilience. And this is hard for me to admit, but our bodies have limits. And so we can't work nonstop without rest. Otherwise we will break and we won't be good to anyone. It doesn't serve anyone. And so, you know, I then have to come back to what gives us hope in this moment and what grounds me in this moment is really building with people around the future. And that is what gives me the most energy and that is what brings me joy and what allows me to move past the challenges. So for every challenge, there is a beacon of light that offers some hope. And maybe that is the paradox of our lives and the paradox of what it means to be human and to lead in a moment like this. You covered a lot of what I was going to say specifically around relationships, because we all know that the currency of organizing in our movements is are the relationships that we build with leaders on the ground. Um, I guess the only thing I, I would add to what you said is that, um, you know, I think for our health and uh, sanity during a time of uh, this pandemic and crisis that we have to learn to resume some of our old routines outside of movement work while also developing new ones uh, to you know, factor in this changing world that we're in. And so you know, what are we doing to take care of our mental health, our physical health outside of this so that we can be strong in our movement work? Hmm. Thanks for that, Chris. And, and what you all said made me reflect too on what's the responsibility of movement followers to support our leaders in these times. And um, Chris, I'm gonna kind of pick up a little bit on that theme with you. So how have things been um, for Move On, grassroots leaders, the broader movement, kind of moving from the individual lens now to the bigger organizational lens? What lessons do you take from this period about resilience for organizations, for movements that have been at it now for year after year in the trenches, sometimes with good results, sometimes not? Um, do you see us turning to each other to support each other? Do you see us turning on each other? Yeah, you know, in some ways, uh, funny enough, Move On was best equipped for the moment in this uh, pandemic that we all experienced together because we were virtual before the pandemic. We had built um, the infrastructure to absorb energy that was literally locked down in this moment and learn to channel that into collective action digitally. And I think a lot of our movement partners had to sort of take up some of these tools to engage in our movement work. I have seen some division within um, organization. Uh, and I think that um, where that comes from is, you know, we're, what we're not doing enough of is engaging in collective power analysis and strategizing. Um, we take on these big fights like Build Back Better. And for a long time, folks did not hear from us, like, where is this fight going? And then clearly we were not winning on this fight, but we weren't having this conversation, this collective power analysis and strategizing with member leaders. Um, and when we don't do that, that's when it could lead to fracturing because someone else is going to develop a power analysis for us. And we might end up being the, the targets of that analysis. Um, and so we have a choice point. Do we allow division in our movements when we don't engage in that? Or do we build solidarity by helping folks understand, okay, so maybe the levers of federal power are not uh, here at the moment. What do we have to do to strengthen our, our power uh, at the federal level? But then maybe that means we shift to state work. Um, where we can fortify the gains that we've made and think about uh, ways to uh, build on those gains. 
Really appreciate that frame of how Unity depends on shared analysis and taking the time for shared analysis and where do we have power, what are the levers, and that's not a one-time event, that kind of shared analysis that has to be an ongoing process. Um, Jen, Lorella, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on the organizational movement perspective, how we're doing. Yeah, I would I would add that um, you know, in Michigan in 2020, we really came together in the time in November around political violence and really came together to ensure that we defended our vote and to ensure that democracy was heard in Michigan. And so where there's been moments um, of hardships where um, you know, maybe internally as organizations of challenges facing this moment of COVID and, and loss of life and um, loss of like the capacity to really center ourselves in, in such chaotic, uh, chaotic moments, we really came together and and then you know we we just came out of our election cycle for municipals and really had 11,000 folks willing to engage after the election and ready to fight for um things that matter to them like the compensation fund where 100,000 folks in Detroit have lost their homes due to foreclosure for unconstitutional overtaxation um assessments and so there's been really, even in this moment where in Detroit, it has been a moment where the gaps have widened, we have come together to demand the, the democracy and the community that we want to see for ourselves. And I think in this moment, we're really turning to each other to, to build a new democracy in Detroit and in Michigan to ensure that we are able to get the things that our communities need. I'll, um, I'll jump in and um, I agree with everything that's been said and I, I, I want to call, I want to call us to turn inward or into towards each other more. Um, and I think it's part what Chris and Jennifer have lifted up and I think it's also part sometimes in moments of despair um, and like when we let despair and hopelessness take over it can be easier to have a misplaced um, target. So we make each other the targets <laughs> as opposed to really looking at the kind of structural barriers and constraints that we are facing. And so that is why what, what you're saying, Chris, so truly resonates with me about just the rigor that we need to exercise to have as a movement and as leaders in this world to constantly be coming back to an honest and sharp assessment of our power. And to remember that we also have agency to stop the things that no longer serve us. Um, and so there is a, there's a way in which we can just continue to recreate or continue to reenact uh, a set of tactics uh, or exasperation or a form of protest that maybe has um, expired in terms of its um, utility and uh, and to be able to really do the hard work of figuring out, well, what are the things and having the courage and the space to think about what are the things we have not yet imagined? What are the fights we have not yet waged? Um, and then I think part of it is being able to hold the long arc. And so I think we're gonna pivot some into this conversation about what last night's uh, leak means for our democracy and what the future um, official ruling from the Supreme Court means um, for democracy and rights work and civil rights and human rights. And I think part of it is really settling into the work, knowing that we may not ourselves see the, we may not see the direct outcome of our work as a concrete win but how we show up in this moment, how we show up in the next 10 years, either creates a more possible future or not. Um, and that we actually have a responsibility and a role to play in shaping what that future will look like and in shaping what that world will hold. And so um, it can be very hard to just sit with the truth that some of the work we may not see its direct fruits. 
um, but that we are really planting the seeds and changing the terrain for those who will wage the fight beyond our time. Um, and you know, I was reading about the reconstruction period and I was reading about LBJ and sort of backlash politics and the role it plays in our sort of politics. Um, and I was reminded about just how much pushback LBJ got, how much, how many warnings he got about his upcoming election if he supported civil rights legislation and how he really leaned in and really made the case that and reminded people that there are a lot more front lash votes than there are backlash votes. And it feels so important in a midterm year and sort of two years from now and so on and so forth, that there are actually many more people in our country who are primed to support, who already support the kind of vision that we hold for every person in this country and beyond. They are just waiting for us to make the case, to organize them, to build the kind of culture and country that they so desperately want. And so are we, the question is actually, are we ready to knock on their doors? Are we ready to place the call? Are we ready to really transcend and operate at a level that is above and beyond the kind of the politics of our movement and actually in direct conversation with your average person in this country, your average voter, that I think is the call to action for us in a moment like this. And I think we can do it with a lot of care for people, with a lot of love for our people. Um, and so I just, yeah, like I feel even with the kind of opinion, the leaked opinion we saw yesterday, like we can remind ourselves to return to, as I think Deepak often tells me, my breath. Right, our breath and the kind of rigorous analysis and the kind of work um, that we know um, does not does not have any shortcuts. Well, you really you really began, Lorella, to go into you know where I was going to take the conversation. So I want to stay with you for a second. I just want to lift up this idea of time horizon. So reflecting on the decision that the Supreme Court, you know, seems likely now to issue as the product of a 50 year effort, right? From the, from the moment of Roe v. Wade, uh, from that decision, there was a massive counter movement that hung in there for year after year after year. And uh, I think your challenge to us to think about time horizon in a different way in our movement is really well taken. So I guess I wanna push the conversation with the three of you about how, how should we be approaching this period in history, this period of backlash, this period of threats and attacks? What needs to change about how we do the work, if anything? Um, and given that democracy itself is now very much under attack, how does the movement need to pivot to meet that particular dimension of the challenge, which arguably is kind of the over the umbrella challenge that we face in this time? So. Well, I'll start with you and then hear from others. Just before I go into the, you know, how do we need to, to change and to continue to reflect on this moment, um, Deepak, um, I think part of it is like, these are decades long systemic failures in the making. And um, we need to stop really um, operating like it's really cycle to cycle. And so I think it is incumbent on us to, um, to, to respond to this moment, like the urgency of the moment, the kind of clarity that this moment gives us is to be able to reject this notion that we have to operate election cycle to election cycle and that we need to have a long arc and a long-term power building plan. Um, and that that's kind of what we have to keep coming back to. Uh, I think it's, it's the thing we don't do well or well enough. I think on the moment, um, one of the big picture things that probably won't be said enough is that this is the right using counter majoritarian institutions to make policy and to lock in white minority rule because they can't actually win free and fair elections. And that their vision for the country is massively unpopular. So 
the Alito opinion goes on and on about how the court is actually being deferential and returning the question of abortion to the political process, which it is, but it is also very aware of how that process is stacked against people. And this is where the long view and the long hour work is so important. So, so as to avoid, I think, a gaslighting about democracy when this is a larger project of locking in white minority rule. Um, I think the second just piece I want to lift here is the, 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 the relevance of a potential decision overturning Roe and Casey is the specter of a country where your rights depend on what state you live in. And that's what happens when lawmaking devolves to the state level due to a dysfunctional Congress and the federal courts can't be relied on to strike down attacks on previously safeguarded rights. So I just wanna make sure that we um, sort of capture the moment and what it tells us about our democracy and what it tells us about the multi-decade long effort and vision that they had, that they waged, not just at the federal level or at the narrative level, narrative power level, but really in states that became the laboratories that really pushed their agenda. And, and I think we don't have to replicate their playbook, but I do think it requires us to look inward as a movement and outward at the external conditions, at the changing conditions and to shift how we do our work. And so one is, um, I think we have to build a shared analysis of the political environment across issues. I think we need to have a shared vision for the future because none of us and none of the people we fight with and for live single issue lives. I think it requires a cleared eyed and rigorous assessment of the limits of our power and the gaps in our political strategy and a plan to build the power we need and to close those strategy gaps, to keep our eyes on what's important and avoid distractions and pitfalls, whether that is reacting to every attack that the right launches or focusing on intra-movement grievances that don't really help us grow stronger and more strategic as a movement. And I think that's the only way we can move forward together and actually win that kind of longer arc beyond the cycle to cycle, the vision about where we're going and what are the kind of big um, down payments or tasks that we need to take on in order to get there and the kind of discipline and rigor that we need to stick to plan and to adjust when necessary. Um, and, you know, I think I, I would like to come back and talk a little bit about what it means to confront the threats to multiracial democracy, but I wanna make sure that Chris and Jennifer also get in. Yeah, Chris and Jen, what needs to change and how we show up, if anything? Well, first, just amen to everything Lorella just laid out. I mean, uh, your vision and, and your articulation and analysis really um, is spot on. I think just to sort of add to what you, you said, um, two things, you know, our movements definitely need to do more state work. We focus a lot on building federal power, but the right has cleverly figured out that they could lock federal power in the states. They could lock it in the states and in the courts. And we have to contest this battle in the states um, against the right. I think additionally is that our movements need to think more about relational power. While the right is trying to think about dominant power over us, we need to think about relational power. And that means that we have to do a lot more recruitment and that recruitment has to live outside of our existing base if we are gonna build the kind of statewide power that can contest with the right. They're focused on building dominant power and dividing and conquering working people of the multiracial working class. And we need to do the sometimes uncomfortable work of building relationships with folks that are not yet with our movements, but are waiting for that invitation to join them. Yeah, I absolutely agree with those remarks. I think the only thing I would add is, you know, our, our inner leadership, 
right? I think in our movement spaces, we really need to ground ourselves of what does it look like to be a different type of leader in this moment? And when I say inner leadership, I'm talking about, you know, uh, readings and writings from Adrienne Marie Brown on emergent strategy, um, also around pleasure, pleasure activism. And, you know, we talked a little bit about what does it mean to be grounded in this moment on your own mental health. But I also believe it's like, what does it mean to be in, in different relationship with one another in movement spaces? You know, I've been um, a leader in movement space for over a decade. And I see shifts on what does it mean to have a uh, real movement relationships with one another. And because we're, we're up against a lot as, as a collective and to have a uh, community care in this moment and to have the capacity to um, really ground ourselves in, in what I call a uh, radical love is what we call at Detroit action for each other. Um, and, and inner leaderships of what does it mean to show up for one another in that way? And in the communities that we're talking about relational organizing, you know, not being transactional, right? So like to be really uh, grounded on issues that impact communities and issues that we wanna see change in a real way. Um, yeah, I'll stop there for, for now, but that's where I'm grounded on. Deepak, so, I can oh, sorry. I'm, Yeah, please I'm go for it. One quick thing to, to Chris's comment, because I think in the same way that we call on candidate campaigns and Democratic Party apparatus to not take any votes for granted, we also cannot afford to take people, all people for granted. And so there's a way in which people might hear what you said, Chris, as meaning that we must only focus or double down on our outreach to white people. And I didn't hear you say that. I heard you say, basically, we're losing working class people across race across the board. And that isn't because they're not ready for us, but it's actually because we are missing the mark on the fundamentals of organizing, which really start with meeting people where they are, not when, not where we want them to be. So I just wanted to like lift that up uh, and to not remember that actually part of this is a return to what we already know is a must do for the work that we carry out. And that is you've got to meet people where they are. They may not respond to the headline or the banner or the chant, but actually to that kind of relationship building you talked about, Chris. I also want to really lift up Jen's point about the inner dimensions here of, of what this is going to take and knowing how much people are holding, you know, working folks are holding, people of color are holding, women are holding in this moment, knowing how much uh, organizers are holding, right? And that as much as we think externally about the strategies for how to move the pieces on the chessboard, which we absolutely have to do, we also have to think about how do we move energy in ourself and with other people in a way that allows us to meet this moment in a, in a productive, um, creative and loving way. So I really appreciate that comment. So we do have some, some questions for you, which really pick up on the themes. And um, I'm gonna kind of, since we're we've got about 10 minutes left. And if anybody has another one, feel free to throw it in the Q&A. Um, so one is like this balance between supporting leaders and accountability for leaders. I think sometimes there's a lot of disappointment in progressive leaders. I'm not gonna give you a specific case that was mentioned in the question because I don't know a ton about it. You may not either, but I think there's a sense of like, how do we do that right in movement? Meaning, an institution or a leader isn't doing what we think they should, how does that get resolved? And what's the balance there? We can't just be uncritical support, right? We're not saying that. So that's kind of one question to reflect on. Second question is, and you've all touched on it, is how do organizations in the movement work together and what needs to change about that? In other words, um, is there the right coalition to meet this moment in history that we find ourselves in? And at any level, you know, and is that state level, at the national level, wherever, you know, you kind of, you kind of see it. So I'll start with those couple and whatever, whatever moves you to, to respond. I mean, I think the, the first question around accountability to the institutions that, um, 
and to the leaders of these of these institutions that we expect to live up to the values that we all believe in and then sometimes make different choices around endorsement and races. Um, you know, I, the way that I like to think about it is also timing and also this sort of back to this political analysis. So um, in 2018 and 2020, we had the public's imagination around progressive leadership and we could go beyond it and really engage in races um, that were exciting and uh, with leaders that could challenge the status quo, we're in a different period in this moment. We're, we're operating really in a moment where we, we've been in power. And so I would just encourage, we've been in power and, and the election could potentially be a referendum on our ability to govern, right? I mean, that's what we're facing right now in this moment. I would encourage us to think really, I think we have to do both things. We have to continue to organize in races that are safe and, and find leaders and support leaders that can challenge the status quo. But at the same time, in this moment when we're experiencing such pol tough political terrain, we also have to think about where we put our resources and where we put member energy. Um, and I would argue that has to be in the races that uh, ultimately support the power building that we want to do. I'm not trying to make choices here. I think we have to do both those work, but, you know, we, and we got the movement to endorse a candidate in Maine last cycle against Susan Collins in a race that was frankly unbeatable and that we poured millions of dollars and millions of hours in volunteer time that could have been uh, strategically uh, put in places where we had the possibility of actually gaining power. So, I, you know, it's just holding the, these two things in tension. And I would ask folks to give us grace as we're thinking about the best place to put our resources. Yeah, I know we're coming up on time. So I'll be brief um, in regards to the second question. You know, if I was able to think through on like the biggest need right now is some of the remarks that already have been made around shared analysis in um, across regions, right? So for me, you know, uh, being based in the Midwest, it would be great to have an organization or some type of uh, opportunities to like really regionalize our shared analysis around the country for our de democracy work and also our base building work. So if we had the capacity to share share lessons on you know how base building is going in X part of the of the region and then you know learn from that those experiments on like on that creativity of base building and also have a shared analysis on how we're gonna ensure that the, the current electeds and positions are electeds that are pushing our progressive values forward would be, would yeah, it would, for me, um, really embark us in a new way of thinking of how to move forward. I think I'll add something and try to be succinct, which is not my strength, I recognize. <laughs> um, I would just say that, um, Part of what needs to change potentially is, um, I think we have to ask our, our, ourselves as organizational leaders and movement leaders, like what are we willing to give of our organizations? And you know, I think part of the, the structural sort of barrier to some of this is the role of philanthropy. Um, but maybe this moment calls on every institutional leader to say, you know, I'm willing to give 30%, 25% of my organizational capacity to this, whatever the, the common good or whatever that collective agenda for power building looks like, um, there's a way in which self-involvement can really take over, both personally for leaders and for institutions. And it becomes all about building brand and uh, visibility and you know they, that they are, that is a form of power and it is also at times needed to raise funds for the work. And so I think that this is also a call to philanthropy to assess how they show up in this moment 
how they need to also shift and pivot. Um, and for all of us to ask this question of what we're willing to give as institutions. Thank you so much for that. I, you know, there's a lot of, there's more questions in the chat that kind of go at some of these questions about strategy and what does it really mean to recruit people who are not already part of the choir and some of the tensions about that. There's some comments, Jen, kind of plussing up your thing about what does actual real local base building look like that that's generative and how do we have more rigorous conversation about that. There's conversation about, um, about funding and how philanthropy gets in the way of what needs to be done and built in this country. So I feel like we could do another hour on the topics that have been raised. We don't have that. So I just want to close by asking you each um, to offer something, somebody who gives you hope, touchstone for you, that gives you hope. Uh, could be a person, could be a reality, could be um, organization could be part of your lineage of movement, what, whatever, uh, whatever moves you. I'll start. Uh, I'll say that I feel a lot of hope after hearing Pramila. It feels really great to have an organizer on the inside organizing democratic institutions. So I, I just feel so hopeful having one of us in those spaces. Um. Yeah, Detroit Action Team, to be honest, uh, you know, uh, Brandon and Brandon, my, the, co the other co-executive director of Detroit Action, and I have been organizing for some time, but looking at organizers that are coming in in this moment with so much hope and rigor and discipline, um, yeah, that gives me hope. Mm. Well, leaders like Jen all over the country give me hope. And um, thank you, Jen, for all the great work you're leading in Detroit and Michigan. Um, and it's just, I think just knowing that there are more front lash votes than there are backlash votes um, gives me a lot of hope for the work. Well, I'll close by saying um, one of the things that gives me a lot of hope is the three of you and the fact that you have stepped into taking on major mantles of responsibility in leadership and movement at you know what is objectively one of the hardest periods I think we have seen in decades and you've done it with incredible grace and wisdom and compassion um, so here's a toast to three of you thank you for your incredible work thank you to the audience for joining us today and again, you can keep connected to the Leadership Institute for Democracy and Social Justice at socialjusticeleadership.org. We'll be announcing some new cohorts, some new programming over the next couple of months. So, so please do connect. And thanks, everybody. And let's keep fighting and keep winning. Take care. <laughs>